us this morning. Oh. They're all good. Good start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said you're not old. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. Hey, uh, yeah, they did go to the bottom of the barrel, at least for me. I'm going to turn 77 in two weeks. So we're just glad to be breathing. <laughs> uh, uh, just can't quite get that in. Uh, let me set it there for now, see if that still works. Well, welcome to our Sunday School, and good morning to everyone here. Uh, we have special guests Karen and I do this morning. It's uh, our son-in-law's mother, Margaret, and uh, her sister, his Aunt Vivian, from right here in Denver. So glad to have you guys with us here this morning. Uh, thank you for all of you that prayed for my eye surgery. I had cataract surgery, the second one, about a month ago. I could hardly read from the back where we sit uh, the uh, uh, words for the song. Now I can read the CCLI line on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I, when, it would, when I would do an eye chart at the doctor's office, I could barely see the chart, let alone the top E. Then when I got my eyes done, we came to the doctor's office all the way down 2020. I said, go another one lower, 2015. And I could have probably gone 2010. I can uh, see everything. Uh, I can see the good, the bad, and the, well, not so bad. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, well, it's just good to be here again to speak, and uh, with fear and trepidation, uh, even though we've been ministering for 55 years, never get over the butterfly speaking in public, right? It's just uh, something the Lord uh, has to work through our weaknesses. I'll start out with something theological here this morning. <clears throat> I heard about this mother one Sunday morning. She went into her son's bedroom and, son, and said, son, wake up. It's time to go to church. He kind of groaned and rolled over and said, Mom, I'm not going to church today. She said, what do you mean you're not going? Why not? He said, Mom will give you two good reasons. One, I don't like those people, and those people don't like me. He said, she said, uh, I'll, that's no excuse. I'll give you two better reasons why you should go. Number one, you're 59 years old. And secondly, you're the pastor. <laughs> now, being a pastor is a wonderful calling. But the thing is, you know that each of us that serve, in my, the name of my thing here today is below deck, is just as important as the ones that are up front. And uh, you have to be a, a pastor or leader of a church to know how important it is for everyone to serve below deck. I teach a weekly home Bible study every Friday evening in our home. We are now completing our second year in the book of Romans. Uh, <clears throat> And we're looking right now in Romans chapter 12, uh, verses 7 and 8. So if you'd open there for a moment. Romans chapter 12, we'll actually start at verse 6. This is not a deep theological message this morning, but a very practical one, no PowerPoint or anything. <clears throat> and I hope my voice holds up too because uh, of the allergies that are troubling us right now. Romans chapter 12. Start at verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, speaking now of spiritual gifts, as does 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or a ministry, let us wait on our ministry, or he that teaches on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Whatever your calling is, whatever your gift, you're to do it with all your heart. You don't have to be a pastor or a missionary to serve God just as fully and satisfactory to the heart of God. And so this morning we want to look at the subject of one particular spiritual gift, which is a gift of ministry, also known as a gift of helps. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful to be here this morning. We humbly come before you and ask, Lord, that you would speak to all of our hearts, that your spirit, Lord, would be upon us. I pray for your special anointing as I speak, and I pray, Lord, that uh, your spirit would go and uh, go into our hearts through the word of God, that, Lord, that we might be fine, sharpened servants, to serve you in whatever calling you have given us. 
In Jesus' name, amen. We've been looking at the subject of spiritual gifts in our Bible study. <clears throat> those gifts that uh, are foundational are those that no longer exist anymore. They were the ones for the apostles and the prophets, the gift of tongues, uh, interpretation of tongues, and so on, that were there when the church didn't have the New Testament yet. They met like in Corinth. They only had the Old Testament, and they had to speak forth prophetically uh, the New Testament truth. And also it was sign gifts that were given for the apostles and for Jesus. <clears throat> now those gifts that still exist today, spiritual gifts, are listed in the Bible as pastor-teacher, teacher, evangelist, that can be public or one-in-one, -one, mercy, exhortation, which is a counseling-type gift, faith, George Mueller-type faith, uh, that's a very special one, givers, that's financial, administration, leadership, and ministry helps. These are the present-day gifts that are qualities that are to be practiced for the most part by all of us, but people are given a special ability in a particular area of these to be able to serve with a sharpness that other people don't have. We're all to be merciful. We're all to be loving. We're all to have these gifts, but there are some that are given, uh, every one of us, according to the Bible in 1 Corinthians 12, is given a spiritual gift. So this is very important. We want to look at the gift of helps. Now, to illustrate this, let me... Uh, give an experience I had years ago. Back in 1980, I was uh, invited aboard the naval vessel USS Trenton LPD landing dock. That's a very special ship as the guest of the chaplain, Dr. Ron Minton, who had been previously in the 70s a deacon in my church, and now he was a chaplain. Uh, <clears throat> this landing dock is a special ship. You go down below deck and uh, the uh, back end of the ship goes down, it floods with water, and all the Marines get in their amphibious vehicles and go out into the water and then on the shore. It's really a special, special type machine. Well, I was there on an overnight cruise with them, a, 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 a civilian cruise. We left for Moorhead City Port in North Carolina and traveled overnight up the Atlantic coast to Norfolk, Virginia as part of an attack group. By the way, I should say, out of thing of interest, uh, with the other ships that were with us, they were signaling with the light signals to each other. And I didn't realize they still did that, but they did. And here as I was watching, da -da 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 -da, they were doing it in Morse code. Now, unbeknownst to the people in that ship, I could read Morse code because I'm a ham radio operator. <laughs> uh, Doug Heilman, uh, who is usually here, he's not here this morning, he's also a fellow ham. Anybody else here a fellow ham radio operator? I'm WB9ZMP. Okay, well, I was reading this and saying, my gosh, I'm going to be privy to some special information here. <laughs> so they started uh, doing it, and I was reading it, and uh, all of a sudden, it starts to say there was a, a priest and a pastor and a Jew who went into a bar. <laughs> <laughs> here they're telling jokes. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I guess they're just practicing. But I thought that's interesting that they did something like that. But anyway, we slept overnight on the ship, and the next morning as we were approaching Norfolk, off in the distance, I said to the chaplain, Ron, I said, is that a skyscraper there? Are we approaching a city? And he said, no, I don't think so. And we got closer to Norfolk. Here was a battleship. Uh, it was a battleship, U.S. says Dwight D. Eisenhower, nicknamed the Mighty Ike. You know, that was his nickname, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. And this is one of the carriers that are over Israel along with the Gerald R. Ford, our two biggest carriers are there. It just came from a long tour. I found out later that the carrier is 24 stories high, almost four football fields long, and a total crew of 6,287 men and women. Absolutely phenomenal. Now the aircraft function for all those people there, all the duties revolve on one, one thing, and that's the flight deck. And that's to get all of the planes and helicopters off as soon as possible in any part of the world. The F-35s that they have now, F-16s, uh, helicopters, the primary purpose of the ship is to deliver its 90 aircraft anywhere in the world as soon as possible to defend our nation. That's part of our triad of America, American defense, land-based ICBMs and silos, a fleet of atomic subs, and our naval fleet of carriers that can deploy attack aircraft anywhere around the globe. Now, on the flight deck of the USS Eisenhower is a very noisy place with all the uh, planes taking off. Um, <clears throat> due to the extreme noise, everybody's wearing ear protection, and all of them are wearing jerseys that are color-coded 
so you know what function they have. For example, purple is aviation fuel handlers. Blue, I found that was plane handlers, tractor drivers, elevator operators. Yellow, flight deck officers and plane directors. Green, operations personnel, catapult and arresting gear personnel. White, safety observers, squadron final checkers, landing signals, officers uh, and corpsmen and so on. The red is the ordnance handlers, EOD, explosives, crash and salvage crews, the brown crew chiefs and mechanics. So you could just look at a person and see what color and what their function was. And that's just on top of the deck. Now you go below the deck of that ship and you wonder what's everybody else doing of the 6,000 people to make those flyboys get off of the deck. Well, that's the purpose of the ship here. They all work to that one end. These flyboys couldn't fly and it was not for the thousands of people below deck. Uh, the ship is a virtual city with restaurants, four mess halls, a large library, a hospital complete with doctors, eye doctors, dentists, several stores, soda fountains, movies, closed circuit TV, radio station, two complete ham radio setups, and have talked to these ships many times, making foam patches for them, plus many more conveniences of community. And you have all these other departments that are there serving all so that the flyboys, the top gun guys, can do their duty. And if it wasn't for those people below deck, they couldn't serve. The engine room, all the mechanics to operate the two Westinghouse A4W nuclear reactors that produced 260,000 horsepower to make that ship go 30 knots. A laundry division washes and dries clothing for all these men and women. Uh, telephone repair, there are 2,000 2, telephones on deck. Post office, library, chaplains, cleaning crews, and garbage handlers. It takes a person two months to know how to get around on that ship. The captain's function is to oversee it all, and the people on top of the deck are doing what they do, but everyone below deck is there for the purpose, for the purpose of those guys getting those planes off. And that's the main purpose of this whole thing, to send the pilots off. Now, the only crew members who get noticed are the top gun guys, but not all the people that are below deck. Uh, without the welders and electricians and the ones peeling the potatoes, that's KP duty, uh, the kitchen patrol, known by the people that do it, is keep, peel keep peeling, keep peeling the potatoes, and handling the garbage, those pilots would be grounded and officers would be helpless without the people peeling the potatoes that are down below so people can eat. Uh, when general quarters is called, everyone immediately goes to battle stations. My dad uh, was on the USS Washington. Uh, it was a battleship in the South Pacific. And he said they were given duties all the time. They were told to swab the decks. Uh, they were, had to go over the side, scrape the paint off and paint it. A couple months later, do the same thing and keep busy. Well, in, when general quarters is called, everyone immediately goes to battle stations. To illustrate, in a similar way, the church operates in the same way. You see the Top Gun guys up here, the pastors ministering, but everything that we do in the local church is for the purpose that they could be up here unencumbered by all the duties that it takes to make a church run. And that's specifically what the gift of helps is. And all of us, whether you have the gift of mercy or exhortation or whatever, all of us are here that the purpose that the, people, the word of God can go forth here from the top. So God has provided his below deck servants here to be able to serve. Now, <clears throat> in this verse that we have here in Romans chapter 12, uh, what it says in uh, verse seven, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. That's the word diakonos in the Greek from which we get the word deacon, a server. And it's that serving person, that deacon, uh, it's a person that does ministry, any kind of ministry that needs to be done. And it's also used for the gift of helps. It's used dozens of times in the New Testament it's a God-given special ability to accomplish practical and necessary tasks in ministry to free up church leaders for their work as the top gun guys. And that's what all of us do for that purpose. Now, we're all to be servers, but uh, those so gifted have a concentrated ability to serve with great effectiveness. Um, it's, our, it's our life calling in ministry. Now, some of you here may, uh, all of us sing or try to sing, or play an instrument, but you know that there are certain people that have perfect pitch. Anyone here have perfect pitch? If someone here did, uh, Karen would be able to hit, I'd say hit a middle C 
or before she did it, the person would be able to hum a middle C and it would be right on. When we were at the Chapel Choir in Lancaster Bible College going around a choir tour, uh, the uh, song leader, Norman Fox, forgot his pitch pipe. And his wife has perfect pitch, uh, Mrs. Fox. And he said to her, would you hum a D? And he did, and we started our a cappella singing with, it, with that. Now, very few people have that. Now, if you, with your spiritual gift, whatever it may be, you have perfect pitch in that perfect ability to serve God, no matter how mundane it may be, no matter how back uh, under deck it may be, it's that important. We're all to be servers, but it's a special ability. Now, the essence of the gift is this, by definition. It's a God-given ability to support the speaking gifts of the church or a Christian organization, making them more effective by relieving them of the more physical ministries in connection with the church's ministry. So all of us, with our function, make it possible for the pilots that are up here with their pilot's license to be able to minister without having to do all the things that are necessary for a church. And if you don't think that your job is important, well, tell that to a person below deck on the USS Eisenhower that neglects his one function. It affects everything up to the top deck. The gift, is not, the gift of helps is not for helping the poor that's, uh, or the widow or the orphan. That's a gift of mercy. It's not the gift of giving amounts of money to advance the cause of Christ. That's the gift of giving. Now, we're all to give. We're all to have mercy. But there are people that God gives a special focus to do that particular gift. And each one of you here need to identify what that is in your life of a spiritual gift. Now, the early church in Jerusalem is a good example. They had a problem. Turn with me to Acts chapter 6, would you please? Acts chapter 6. Acts of the Apostles. They had a problem. People were getting saved left and right. On the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. Uh, a short time later, it was 5,000. And there were so many people coming in, and there was no welfare system, and they had a problem with supporting all the widows. And so we see here at the beginning of Acts chapter 6, in those days where the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So we had the local uh, widows and those that were from um, out of the country or those that were part of the uh, Roman aspect. When the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them, said, it is not reason, now this is the twelve disciples, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now they were, they've been serving tables. They're not too proud to serve tables. The ministers here at this church, they do mundane jobs, but they can't spend all their time on it. And what was happening here is they were spending all their time distributing food to all the widows that were in need in the church. And so they said, it's not proper that we should leave the ministry of the word of God to do all the other jobs that need to be done. Uh, and so, wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we appoint over this business. And we will give ourselves continually to prayer, this is apostle speaking, then we can give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They, it wasn't too low for them to do, it's just that they had a higher priority of studying the word and teaching the word to the people, all these thousands of people that were coming in. So it's a very special thing here. It says to the ministry of the word, and uh, we have that word ministry again, and the appointing of deacons down here, which is that word diakonos. They were the ones that were to relieve those that were in the speaking gifts uh, in the local church. So they had to teach and they had to pray. And when somebody teaches up here, you have to assume that there's at least 10 to 15 hours per message that the person is preparing for. So it's study, teach, and pray. That's STP. Anybody here a mechanic, you know what that stands for? Scientifically treated petroleum. <laughs> you add, that's an oil additive. And so I always think STP is the minister's job, study, teach, and pray. And so the deacons were appointed to relieve them of those other duties. Um, and Ephesians chapter 4 is very important on this too. Uh, let, let's turn there just for a moment quickly. Ephesians 4, at least I have more time than our brother did here. The first morning service is really short. Uh, Ephesians 4. Bless you. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended is he also that he descended first into the low parts of the earth. I won't go into that. That's a whole other study. He that descended is also the same that ascended up far above the heavens that he might fulfill all things. And gave some, and here's the gifts that he was talking about, apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And the gifts of these flyboy gifts, speaking gifts, was for the purpose, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints. And as a result, in the Greek here, then the saints are to do the next function for the work of the ministry. And so it just follows, the, it's not the pastors that are do the work of the ministry. This is the word diakonos again, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, so the office of deacon was established, uh, 1 Timothy 3, and uh, then we have the gift of deaconing or serving. Now, a key characteristic of the gift of helps, as you consider each characteristic of the server gift, both positive and negative, see if that describes you. I'm going to give some of the characteristics of the gift. See what your shirt color is. Number one, if you have the gift of helps, you are task-oriented rather than public speaking oriented. Some would rather die than have to get up front and speak in church. <laughs> and, uh, but you're happy to serve where you are, and uh, <clears throat> you're task-oriented. You like to work with your hands. These people are vital, vital serving quietly below deck, each in their, in their way. The cleaning of the building, ordering supplies, arranging of tables for classes, the music, the sound system, uh, the recording of the services every Sunday, setting up for communion, preparing our fellowship meals, lawn care, our ushers who take the offering, taking attendance, the financial duties of the treasurer, the scores of functions for VBS, ah, uh, VBS. Talk about needing below deck servers. VBS, you need craft workers, food, music, games, flyers, advertising, making the scenery, registration. You know how hard it is uh, with VBS. If you're a leader or in VBS, all the servers that it takes to do that. This is so all the teachers can teach. Secondly, you have a uh, characteristic of having a preference to remain behind the scenes. You free up the front, uh, up front speakers for their ministry. Uh, getting up the front to speak may be frightening to you. <clears throat> we make a mistake many times and we look back at the Old Testament, we say, gotta be like Moses, gotta be like David. Well, Moses was a leader, but how about the other one and a half million to two million people that were in their tents serving God? What did God just expect of them? To gather the manna every day, to be faithful, and the uh, Levites and the, and the priests to be able to serve in the tabernacle. God just expected basic faithfulness, and it was time to go to battle. They were ready to go. Thirdly, you're alert to practical needs and have a built-in radar for this purpose. You see something broken and you fix it. You especially enjoy manual products. Bible assembly is a perfect example of that. Now, you don't have to have the gift of helps to be in Bible assembly. Anybody can do it, but a person with the gift of helps jumps at it because that's something I can do with my hands and serve the Lord in a very practical way. And so that's an example of it. Uh, you especially enjoy manual project. You're motivated by love. You don't get the upfront attention uh, that the uh, pastors or the teachers get but uh, you remain behind the scenes. All this so that the church's flyboys can fly unimpeded. Our flyboys include pastors Keith, Terry, and Seth. And so everything that we do as a church in our little corner, our little position, is all so that the pastors can be up here unhindered as the first apostles were from all the duties. I pity the pastor of a small church, and I had pastored a small church, and you get to do everything. <laughs> Janitor, uh, making the bulletins, uh, painting the church, whatever, and you get busy in a lot of things. Uh, this church has so many talented people, so many young people, that are young men that aren't afraid to get up in front of the church and preach. I think this church is blessed. We are truly blessed. Some of the weaknesses of the gift. You have a tendency to be a perfectionist. <laughs> you may be hard on others or serve with you. You have pitch perfect, like a person that has pitch perfect and they hear an instrument or somebody singing out of tune, it drives them crazy. Well, a person that has this gift may feel that way with people that assist them in their manual tasks. Secondly, you have a hard time saying no to requests for service. You can get burdened with too many tasks because you don't like to refuse that the pastor asks, I need help with this, we need a volunteer for this, and they want to do everything. And I've seen people over the years get burnout 
because you're doing everything. You don't want to do that. You still have to take care of yourself and your family. Uh, you may neglect your own needs and the needs of your own family because of it. Another weakness is you would rather work alone and not involve others. They just get in your way. You mothers that are here, you have uh, small children, you're cooking, and, and the uh, child says, I'm going to help you, mommy. <laughs> want to help, quote, unquote. That makes, makes the cooking taste twice as long and everything else. Most of the time, you'd rather work alone, not all the time. But, but now, opportunities abound in Christian service. One of the questions I've got asked over the years is, I don't feel I'm doing enough for the Lord. I want to do more. I feel like I'm called into full-time service, but I don't have any speaking gifts. Well, uh, you don't have to have a speaking gift. Uh, there's many people that serve on the mission field, uh, in Christian organizations, as accountants, business managers, lawyers, uh, secretaries, ag services, mechanics, pilots, such as MAF, teachers in Christian schools, artists, engineers, editors, photographers, printing skills, medical, dental, cooks, electricians, instrumentalists, music, camp workers, you can go on and on. And for many of these, you don't have to raise support like a missionary. Now, Terry and Wendy Davis here at this church are a prime example of somebody that's full-time using their hands in their ministry as well as you know, being a witness, but uh, can use their hands in a full-time ministry for the Lord, and our church supports them as one of their supporting churches. Um, the Christian schools, college campuses, YFC, CEF, and East Pete, uh, Christian broadcasting such as Transworld Radio, FEBC, printing companies, one example is at the school I attended, Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, Billy Sunday's home. I served as one of two auto mechanics in 1969 as a stu student worker in the 60s. Uh, Grace had uh, uh, many, many vehicles, and it was full time, including a crane, a bulldozer, uh, buses, cars, and uh, so we kept busy full time. Um, now, also on the campus, there was groundskeepers, 180 acres, one person just mowed full-time. He got paid for mowing full-time, full-time ministry. Full-time welder, Mr. Miley. Full-time electrician, Joe, with his own truck. A full-time plumber with his own truck. Printers in the print shop, bookstore personnel, cafeteria, cooks, janitors, uh, secretaries, financial people, all full-time workers at the Christian school putting out uh, pastors and Christian missionaries so that the the uh, fly boys, which are the teachers and instructors and professors, can have and concentrate on their teaching. And that's the principle here below deck for us as well. An important principle here is attitude. Those so gifted do behind the scenes work must not look on others who are not on their level of service of being indifferent. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10. A few minutes we have here yet. Luke chapter 10, you remember the story of Mary and Martha Martha's so encumbered about with so much service. Now, this is a good contrast here in services. Uh, I want to read starting in verse 38 of Luke 10. Now, it came to pass as they, that's Jesus and the 12 disciples, and he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received them into their house. And, he, and she had a sister called Mary. Now, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were Jesus' best friends. And he would stop there often with his disciples to eat a meal, who also sat at Jesus' feet. Mary did, the younger sister, and heard his word. But Martha, now she was in the kitchen. <laughs> she was cumbered about with much serving. Could you imagine if the 12 disciples were there? It's 12, Jesus, 13, uh, then 3, 14, 15, 16 people. And she's making a meal about modern conveniences. Martha was cumbered about with much serving and came to him. But Jesus out here having a Bible class. With, you know, with the disciples, and there was her sister Mary, and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she held me. <laughs> she was really steamed more than the vegetables. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. That was her personality. But one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. But notice, he didn't say, okay, Mary, get in there and help your sister. Or he didn't say, uh, so Martha, stop cooking and get out here and listen in the Bible study. They each had their purpose. Now, one was more personal, and he said he has chosen the better part, but they both had their purpose. Now, you ladies are going to be faced this Thanksgiving. You're going to be in the kitchen cooking. All the relatives are going to be out in the living room talking and chatting and telling stories, and you're here in the kitchen, and you're missing all this stuff. 
Well, that's how she felt. But you know, when it's time to eat and everybody gathers around the table for the prayer and you bring out the turkey or the ham or whatever it is, you're the hero. And there's something about eating together that binds fellowship together. That's why communion is, is a meal. It's, it's, it's a time of special fellowship together. And so we see that this was a very special thing. Uh, you have to serve with your heart as well as with your hands. And so they both had their part in this. Now, <clears throat> below deck service is unseen, but just as vital as the flyboys. Uh, our flyboys flying the F-16s are pastors Keith, Terry, and Seth. They're here, and everything we do is to be able to help the church run smoothly. Now, we're entering a building project. It was really a great groundbreaking last week. If you were there, it was wonderful. Uh, I took a lot of pictures. And it's just uh, a wonderful thing. And our church is going to stay unified through this. Uh, there won't be any arguing over what color the walls are going to be or the color of the carpet. I've seen churches divided over less or who the piano player is going to be and all this. You're fortunate to have all the musicians you do here. And so it's uh, going to be a special time as we come to that. Um, a king once went into his garden and found everything withered and dying. Speaking to an oak that stood near the gate, he found it was sick of life because it was not tall and beautiful like the pine tree. The pine was discouraged because he could not bear delicious fruit like the pear tree, while the pear tree was upset because he did not have the lovely odor of the spruce. And so it went throughout the entire garden. Come to a little pansy, the king found its bright face as full of cheerfulness as ever. Said the monarch, well, little flower, I'm glad you find uh, I find one who is happy in this, amid this general scene of discouragement. Your majesty, said the pansy, I know I am of small account, but I concluded that you wanted a pansy where you planted me. If you had wanted an oak or a pear tree, you would have set one in the place I occupy. So I am bound to be just the best little flower that I can ever be. The king smiled at the lovely pansy which brightened its corner of the garden, for its faithfulness gladdened his heart. And you have a unique place Make the most of it. Do it with all of your heart. We take it for granted on Sunday mornings that the church is clean, the hymn books and the Bibles are neatly arranged in the seats, the temperature is set correctly, the sound projection system is operating, the bulletins and the handouts are printed and made available. You may be saying to yourself, well, I could be doing more. Well, all of us have an effect on people we don't realize. In, I pastored the church in the 80s, the decade of the 80s, the Grace Church in Roarstown Road, just off of Route 30 exit. And we had a couple there, Joe and Nancy Badia. A wonderful, wonderful young couple. They had two boys, their desire was always to have a girl, and they weren't able to do that. Well, there's something special about this woman. Nancy Hamilton Badia, related to the Hamilton Company over here in Ephrata. And she, when I was always asked, what's prayer request tonight? She would always raise her hand. My brother who needs the Lord, Bob Hamilton. My father who needs the Lord, Bob Hamilton. Uh, my neighbor, uh, Lil, and her daughter needs to come to the Lord. And she would go on and on every week requesting prayer for people that she had a burden for in her heart. She's a housewife. Can I say just a housewife? But she had a tremendous effect upon people. She was 38 years old, got pregnant. In the hospital, she had a girl. So they had two boys, a little girl. A couple hours later, while she was in the hospital bed, she had a brain aneurysm. I went in and was able to still feel her shake, grab my hand when I would talk to her. Then she had a second aneurysm and she died. 38 years old, leaving a husband and three little kids behind. Her husband, Joe, came to me and said, why, Pastor? You don't have an answer. At a time like that, it doesn't sound trite. Joe, I don't know. I don't know. God does have a purpose in all things, but I can't answer. What well, came the day of the funeral? The center of the church was full. We had to open the wings. It was full. 300 people were there for this housewife's funeral. It moves me to this day. I'm sorry. When I gave the invitation, as I always do at the end of a funeral sermon, I went through the Lord's, you know, uh, coming to the Lord in the prayer. I said, how many people prayed that prayer with me? 25 people raised their hand. I had a time of dedication. She was the dedicated woman and set an example. How many would like to be like that? 
Over 50 people raised their hand. I saw Joe grieving down over here with the family was seated. I went down to him off the pulpit and I said, Joe, stand up. And I said, all of you that made a decision, raise your hand. And he turned around and saw that. And guess who was standing there? His brother, her brother, her father, her neighbor, her neighbor's daughter, and all those that she had been praying for. They all came to the Lord that day. And that has moved me to see what a housewife can do for the Lord. You may think you're not doing much. You're just raising your kids, being a faithful wife. And she had that much effect on people. Be faithful where you are. God has a purpose. God will bless you if you're faithful in the small things. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we are here today, we thank you that you have brought people into this church that are faithful and have a great impact on people through their spiritual gift, whether it be helps or whatever it is. And Lord, that you truly have blessed. But Lord, I pray that everyone here knows Jesus Christ as a personal savior before it's eternally too late, because once we exit life, the physical life, it's too late. Now, Lord, all of us here want to hear those words when we stand before you one day. Well done thou good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.